every ice hockey player who laces up a pair of skates, dons a sweater, and graduates to the highest level of competition, strives to become a member of an exclusive club. Toronto is home to Ice Hockey's Hall of Fame, a place where the sport's greatest figures are enshrined forever as legends of the game. But up until 1958, black hockey players were denied the chance to reach that goal because they were kept out of the National Hockey League. Between 1940 and 1954, the late Herbert Carnegie was one of the greats of the senior hockey leagues of Canada. But because of the colour of his skin, he never made it to the NHL. It was June 2001 when we travelled to Toronto to find out more about him. He was 81 then and blind due to glaucoma. The three or four thousand fans were silent, except for one guy. The taunt was as caustic and humiliating as my first childhood experience of this sort of mindless, hurtful comment. When I skated off the ice, Bob Crosby put his arm on my shoulder and whispered into my ear, the way to answer that remark, Herbie, is to put the red light on. Audrey Carnegie, Herb's wife, was reading from his autobiography, A Fly in a Pail of Milk. Vicious racial abuse held at Herb from crowds was sadly not uncommon. Like thousands of youngsters who set out to succeed in Canada's national game, Herb started by taking to the ponds. He developed his talent on the ice in the Toronto suburb of North York. Yet his father was skeptical about his hockey future. He knew that uh, I wanted to play professional hockey. Uh, he was told by his people at work that uh, your son will never play in the National Hockey League because the other boys won't travel with him. Now, I got that message when I was about uh, 14, but uh, that went over my head because uh, I knew who I was, I knew what I could do. And that was a case of, I'll show you. And show them he did. Carnegie's talent was evident on the semi-pro circuit as he turned out for teams like the Quebec City Aces. He led his sides in scoring on several occasions and won three Most Valuable Player awards. In 1941, Herb moved to the Buffalo Anchorite and together with his brother Ozzie and Herb McIntyre formed the first all-black line in hockey history. The former teammate and future Montreal Canadiens legend Jean Beliveau described him as one of the greatest players he had ever seen. It seemed only a matter of time before the NHL came calling. And why not? Just down the road, Jackie Robinson was breaking down baseball's color barrier as he turned out for the Montreal Royals, the Brooklyn Dodgers farm team. Frankly, I was delighted that it happened because in a sense it opened up uh, a possible discussion in the boardroom. However, despite Jackie Robinson becoming a star in New York during the 1950s, for Herb, the opportunity to make a similar impact was something he was always denied. The most devastating thing to me was knowing that um, players on my team were getting the opportunity for tryouts, whose record wasn't as good as mine, which clearly showed discrimination and racism of the highest order. It was losing faith in humanity, you might say. I knew this is what he wanted, but I always had a feeling, I don't know, they weren't, they weren't ready for that. And uh, it was true. The times were not ripe for him to be in the NHL. In 1954, at the age of 34, Herbert finally hung up his skates in order to spend more time with his wife and four children. He never did realize his dream of playing for his hometown Toronto Maple Leafs. Willie O'Ree would become the first black NHL player four years later. But Herb was not to live the rest of his life in bitterness, thinking about what might have been. His philosophy was to turn the negative into a positive, and in 1955 he opened the Future Aces Ice Hockey School. 
it was the first of its kind, teaching children how to pass, stick handle and shoot. The idea came to me, if we have the fundamentals of the game of hockey, why can't we have the fundamentals of how to live? And what are they? From my point of view. I was excluded from hockey. I wanted something that was in inclusive. Carnegie then wrote the Future Aces Creed. This developed into the Future Aces Foundation, a charitable organization run by his daughter, Bernice. The Future Aces Creed is a guideline for people to show expectation of what a good citizen should be. And what it does is it helps, in this particular case, young people and all people to, um, to go forward with their life, to take a look at how they should choose to make responsible choices in life. And that's really what it's about. It's about what you do yourself to make a difference. The Creed was a success with Ontario's multicultural schools, and today it's distributed in over 14 languages. The foundation has also delivered hundreds of thousands of dollars in scholarship funds. Or two or three or more. In addition, Carnegie went on to become a successful businessman and a pretty good golfer too, winning two Canadian senior titles. Herb's impact on the community was such that Marvel Comics put out two editions of Spider-Man, featuring Carnegie as a real-life comic book hero. When we met him, despite being in his 80s, Herb was still managing to make over a hundred presentations a year around Toronto, some in the arena named after him. His impact is so great that some feel that it was a blessing in disguise that Herb never made it to the NHL, because if he had, his other contributions might never have taken place. By the way, before you speak, can we play on your ring? I, 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 I think I'll let you. <laughs> All the For a man who accomplished so much and received countless awards, there was one last honor he was striving for, to be elected to the NHL's Hall of Fame in the Builder of the Sport category. <laughs> Thank you. Nice. Good luck to you. Yeah. There's, uh, it, it, it would be nice. My family would be delighted. My friends would be delighted. There's so many people out there that are pulling for me to be in the, in the Hall of Fame. To this day, the committee responsible for electing people to the NHL's Hall of Fame has failed to recognize his achievements. Whether he's ever given that honor, Herb, who died in 2012, aged 91, will forever be enshrined in the minds of those whose lives he touched. <laughs> Off to Elliot Friedman we go, Elliot. We're on tonight in Boston, the Bruins are honoring Willie O'Ree for breaking hockey's color barrier 50 years ago. But in Toronto, one of the proudest gentlemen is a man by the name of Herb Carnegie. But as he celebrates O'Ree's achievement, he can't help but wish he'd had his own chance. Foster Hewitt, hello, Canada. And hockey fans of the United States and Newfoundland. We've come to the end of the 60 minutes of regulation play and the score is still tied. Nothing, nothing. Like millions of Canadian children, Herb Carnegie fell in love with hockey through Foster Hewitt. The Rangers, Bill Cook to score! The son of Jamaican immigrants, good enough a golfer to become a two-time Canadian amateur champion, Carnegie was a talented player, the headlines of the day flattering, even if politically incorrect by today's standards. He had a good career in the Quebec Senior League, a teammate and lifelong friend of Jean Beliveau's. They were reunited a couple of years ago. I backhanded the, the puck and he called in the shin pads and went past uh, Plum. That's how I got my goal. You shouldn't say that. You should say you ripped a wrist shot for 25 feet right by Jacques Plant's glove. 
Although 88 and blind is a result of glaucoma, Carnegie, very alert, hasn't forgotten how his NHL career was derailed. In 1948, he felt he deserved to make the Rangers out of training camp, but was told to go to the minors. The deeper cut actually came 11 years earlier, when Maple Leaf founder Con Smythe decided he couldn't play for Toronto. I was good enough for the Leafs. Because according to Con Smythe, I would take Carnegie tomorrow for the Maple Leafs if someone can turn them white. Now I got that statement when I was 18. How would you feel? I feel awful. I can't forget it because he cut my knees off. He broke my legs. <laughs> horrible. So I don't want people to go through that. <laughs> I can go back to that, that very moment <laughs> when Ed Wildey had me at the side of the boards and, and telling me the story. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Carnegie needed a few minutes, his daughter Bernice helping before he could continue. I loved the game. And I feel cheated. I didn't get the chance to prove myself wrong. I just had a door closed where I couldn't participate. It is a testament to Mr. Carnegie's strength of character that he did not let what happened embitter him for the rest of his life. Instead, he used it as motivation to try and effect change, to try and make things better. His efforts worked, and he's being recognized. This school, being built just north of Toronto, is being named in his honor. As much fun as I had in the game, I had pain because I couldn't have that other step. Now, I don't want that to happen to anybody else. Carnegie started a popular hockey school, Future Aces, then created a foundation under the same name. For more than 50 years, he's worked to improve relations. He was drawn into a Spider-Man comic, helping Spidey stop smugglers from using pucks to transport drugs. An honorary chief of police, he's achieved what he promised to do. What helped me, in a sense, to design a code, not of conduct, but a, a philosophy for behavior. And when I wrote that statement, in my pain and my anger, I smiled. And I smiled because I said, Herb, if you can do that, you're gonna be okay in this world. Mission accomplished.